everyone. Uh, good afternoon to Francesca Orsini. Uh, welcome to the 22nd BN Ganguly Memorial Lecture at CSDS. Uh, my name is Avdhendra Sharan and I'm currently the acting director of the center. Uh, the Ganguly lectures are held in the memory of the distinguished economist, Professor BN Ganguly, former chairman, board of governors of CSDS. Distinguished previous speakers have included Professor Charles Taylor, Bhikkhu Parekh, Ernst Gellner, Michael Walzer, John Keane, Giorgio Agamben, Bina Agarwal, Jose Casanova, Partha Chatterjee, Dipesh Chakravarti, Leela Gandhi, and Leela Abu Ligod. Today's lecture will be delivered by Professor Francesco Orsini, Professor of Hindi and South Asian Literature at School of Oriental and African Studies, <coughs> University of London, and a fellow of the British Academy. Professor Orsini will be speaking on Hindi internationalism, literature, and the Cold War. So a very warm welcome to Professor Orsini again, and welcome to all of you. I now request my colleague, Dr. Ravikant, to introduce the speaker and chair the proceedings. Ravikant. Thank you, uh, Professor Sharan. Uh, 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 Deepu has already introduced Professor Orsini, uh, but I will, uh, you know, uh, do a formal and uh, informal bit, both, uh, as a kind of mixed interaction, because Francesca has been a friend to many of us at CSDS and its larger network since the early 2000s. We had invited her to speak in Hindi on her newly published and soon to have become a classic book, The Hindi Public Sphere, an essay based on which she contributed to Diwane Sarai 01. Uh, Hindi Lokvrit, is, it is called in Purushottam Agrawal's translation, uh, taking Habermas to corners he would not have traveled on his own. She is a member of the editorial advisory board of our peer-reviewed journal, Pratiman. And although it is not easy, I have tried to engage with some of her works from the large oof she has created. Her other monograph, Print and Pleasure, Popular Literature and Entertaining Fictions in Colonial North India is a particular favorite of mine. Some of the other volumes individually or collaboratively edited by Francesca are Love in South Asia, A Cultural History, uh, Before the Divide, Hindi and Urdu Literary Culture, and with Sh Samira Sheikh, after Timur left, Culture and Circulation in 15th Century North India, which is a book in honor of Simon Digby. With Catherine Butler Schofield, she has a telling, tellings and texts, music, literature, and performance in North India. It has been a great pleasure and a huge learning experience working with her on a project on the phenomenon of language mixing and our book, English Life, uh, with contributions from several young uh, scholars should, inshallah, be out soon from Orient Black Swan. I also enjoyed reading your recent essay on Kasbai literature and Kasbas in pre-modern North India. That essay and this lecture are, I assume, from your latest multi-continental project called Literature and Multilingual Society. It should be clear to all of you very soon that she lives in and works from several countries, languages, and nations. And it's, it's a huge pleasure reading her. I'm sure you are going to enjoy this lecture. Welcome, Francesca. Thank you very much. And, uh, and I wish that the director had not uh, read the list of previous speakers because when he first invited me and, and read that, I thought, oh, there must be some, uh, some mistake there. <laughs> we say, of course, in Hindi, ghar ki murgi dal barabar. And I feel this is a kind of a, a opposite case of ghar ki dal murgi barabar. But uh, I suppose in a COVID year, you can't be too choosy. So here I am. But of course, it's a huge honor and a pleasure to be sharing my latest um, research with you. 
uh, it is part of this new project, well, soon in fact to be ending project called Multilingual Locals and Significant Geographies, where we've been trying to sort of take on the um, uh, particularly Anglophone, uh, disappointingly Anglophone uh, sort of uh, turn that comparative literature has taken as world literature from the perspectives of North India, multilingual North India, multilingual Maghreb and multilingual Horn of Africa. So this is part of that, um, that, that, that work and uh, research and uh, goes back to my original love of working with magazines. So here, I'll just start sharing my PowerPoint and I will start. So let me start from the subtitle, Literature and the Cold War. It's, um, it's been quite a hot topic in, uh, recent, uh, in recent years. These are some, just some of the many actually uh, books that are coming out um, uh, or have come out. In fact, we have one from our project coming out sometimes hopefully uh, next year called The Form of Ideology and Ideology of Form. Um, and, and from an earlier focus on the Cold War, Cold War literature as mainly propaganda, so the kind of the propaganda efforts uh, and networks either by the um, you know, International Council for uh, Cultural Freedom with its Indian and other uh, branches Inter, you know, international sorry, Congress for Cultural Freedom uh, to instead the uh, left, um, I mean, USSR and China propaganda uh, efforts. So in this kind of literature, as you can see, um, as you can gather, Asia, Africa, or Latin America, and Europe, in fact, appear as kind of checkboards for the struggle between the two, um, the two superpowers. To now a growing body, of work or scholarship on local actors, uh, contexts and struggles and meanings of the key terms, peace and freedom. As in, for example, Letizia Zecchini's uh, recent great, uh, uh, great article. Um, and, um, and also, you know, very good recent Palgrave handbook of Cold War literature thinking about what are the what are the what are the genres of cold literature? Uh, the testimonial, the travelogue, the conference report, the printed speech, the spy novel, and today um, I will focus on the magazine and the short story. Uh, in India, particularly in the 1950s, I'm not quite sure whether that continues in the 1960s. You you, you also have uh, you know it is easy to overlay Cold War France onto local groupings. Here, for example, from the uh, magazine Kahani, you have an article by Amrit Rai uh, on Sanskritic Swadhinta ke ye Alambardar, uh, so denouncing a Parimal literary conference in Allahabad as being, you know, um, connected to the, you know, foreign hand of the uh, Congress for Cultural Freedom. And in fact, the first uh, Congress um, in Bombay in 1951 was organized by the secretary was Aguirre. Uh, so it's easy to see, uh, you know, the mutual accusations and suspicions. And interestingly, the revelations in the 60s that the uh, ICCF uh, funding magazines like Quest in India or Al Hivar um, in Arabic or transition had received CIA funding. So the ICCF was funded by the CIA and other sort of intermediate foundations, toppled the uh, Arabic magazine Al Hivar, hasted the demise of Rajat Niyogi's transition, but do not, does not seem to have taken anybody by surprise in India. Um, so magazines. Now magazines, so again, there's an interesting uh, uh, book just on the magazines, uh, the journals of the Congress for Cultural Freedom. There was one in Italian too, Tempo Presente, in German, in French and so on, Encounter in English, um, have been the subject of some, um, um, of some work. And also magazines as part of a sort of as a world literary form, but little magazines. Again, if you're interested, uh, I'm co-running with a colleague, a series on the magazine and world literature, a series of webinars, uh, which are open to everybody. 
but today, rather than you know some uh, sort of either a small magazine or um, you know magazines that are clearly funded and aligned with one of the one of the fronts, um, I want to focus rather um, on the Cold War, decolonization, non-alignment as context for Hindi internationalism in the 1950s and to early 70s. And by that I mean a form of literary activism, to use a term that Amit Chaudhary has derived in, in recent years, by magazine editors that aim to cultivate an internationalist outlook in ordinary Hindi readers, so these are ordinary magazines, so not small magazines, but, but really mainstream story magazines, and they try to imagine what internationalism and decolonization could mean in literary terms. Go the next one, yeah. So, um, so you know, the magazine in between these kind of constellations. And why do I think it is interesting and potentially important? Well, for, first of all, I think because it highlights a particular use of the magazine and the short story for world making, both literary world making, and I think generally, as I say, to cultivate a kind of a, an awareness of the world. Secondly, it makes us rethink assumptions about Hindi as provincial or as a vehicle of chauvinistic nationalism. I think some, as you will be surprised, I certainly was surprised by the internationalism of Sarika under Kamleshwar. I don't think I've seen any, um, any such um, diverse uh, internationalism in any magazine, um, certainly any mainstream magazine. Um, it also makes us rethink what it takes for world literature to be accessible, visible and readable, particularly from a current conjuncture where, as I said, I think, you know, there's a lot of talk of world literature, but then actually it's quite difficult to find and for it to be visible and, and accessible. Um, so thinking about not just how you know, the magazine and a platform, but also how do they get their stories? How do the stories circulate? So as I say, the Cold War as a context, the magazine as a platform and a medium that offered actually quite different possible strategies and the story as a currency. And keywords in this are visibility, what parts of the world are being made visible? How does the magazine make the world visible or world literature visible? orientation, of course, uh, so it's never the whole world, but how also political orientation um, guides a certain visibility and the creation of familiarity. So this is different both from Vishwabhasha Hindi, which seeks to transform the history of Kuli migration into cultural capital of Hindi as Vishwabhasha, nor is it Vishwasahitya in the terms of the, uh, the first book on uh, World literature in Hindi, uh, Padum Lal Punalal Bakshi's uh, Vishwa Sahitya uh, from 1924, so uh, quite early, um, which takes um, a kind of civilizational, typically a civilizational um, um, sort of approach, or, of, or from idea, uh, Tagore's idea of uh, Vishwa Sahitya, which of course is something completely different, has nothing to do with kind of uh, um, countries and states and so on. So these are my questions. Uh, how do magazines, sorry, do world literature and make it visible? Does political orientation guide literary visibility, but also does it imply a particular aesthetic? Um, and I think, first of all, uh, to start with, it's useful to think about, um, so I will focus mainly on Kahani, um, the story edited by, uh, sorry, the story magazine edited by Sri Patrai and uh, Sarika, particularly under the editorship of Kamleshwar. But I think it's useful to think of these magazines within the general ecology of magazines in the 1950s and 60s. And um, I mean, I know Ravi Khan knows a lot about it, but you know, just to remind you, of, these are just the, the, the newspaper and magazines that <clears throat> just the Times of India group had. So really magazines, you know, in a sense penetrated every uh, or wanted to penetrate every aspect of, um, of people's lives. 
and, and of course, very much in kind of aware of each other, in dialogue with each other. Uh, also, I think it's useful to uh, bear in mind that, um, that um, if we look at the, at the content, actually, uh, if you, this, is, this is, for example, from the Illustrated Weekly of India, you will see that, you know, a lot of the content, a lot of the stories, you know, you've got these columns. Uh, so, um, Bhasha uh, writing, you could say, and English writing or English magazines were not so, you know, separate or, or distant uh, or even uh, opposed as we would expect now. Of course, not on the not on the topic of language itself. Language wars are certainly going on, but really in terms of maybe sensibility or orientation. Now, um, before I come to focus, this is interesting uh, to think about. You know that ac actually all magazines um, do world literature at the time in some form, from caravan to huge chetna. So. This is a sort of sense of the need to be worldly, to have some kind of op window open to the world, um, but not the different strategies. So um, some like Kahani do what I call textual presence. So they do world literature or, um, or in fact translation through, um, sorry, uh, Indian literature through translations. And in fact, it was me really, for me really interesting and surprising that, you know, you go to Kahani knowing that this is a magazine in which you know some of the some of the issues look like encyclopedias of the hindi story you know you get badlon uh, kegere or you know you get in fact toba tek singh already very early on um so you think it's really about hindi literature or with a few translations but in fact half of every issue was on translations from contemporary indian languages but then there was one story always foreign story and I go to it in a moment. Even a magazine, uh, which in the 50s, war, 40s, 50s, was a kind of what I call a, a middle brow English magazine, uh, Caravan, has uh, both world novel translate condensed as well as short stories from around the world. And I call it kind of random systematicity because you know you've got the systematic one um, story per, per month. But then what, what writer represents that story is quite random. So I think Arabic, for example, is some German Konrad Ben Berkovici, Japan is Lafcadio Hearn. So, you know, a bit random, really. Then you've got uh, magazines like Quest or Yug Jetna, which in fact uh, starts uh, in the 50s uh, as a magazine of world literature. Uh, but what they do is they they have actually very few direct stories or poems, you know, not so more like an indirect presence, more critical articles. Um, Yuchekna seems to be really coming out of uh, Lucknow University, so it's very kind of canonical, you could say, Anglo-American and some French. Quest, um, like other ICCF um, magazines, would have writers from non-communist writers from Russia and Asia. And then Asia and Africa, you have a lot of articles on the problem of the intellectual. And of course, it's a platform for um, Indian poetry in English, early poems by Kolatka, Ramanujan and so on, and some translations from Indian languages. Um, Kalpana, I'm not going to talk about it today, but it's really interesting because what it does, um, so more kind of highbrow, you could say, more literary, arty, magazine in Hindi, um, covers by Hussein, M.F. Hussein, um, and Mittal was uh, the art director. What it does, instead of having direct translations, it, um, it translates articles by the U.S. magazine Books Abroad, which are these long surveys of about 10 pages, full of names of, you know, uh, world literature. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, it's really striking because actually, you know, you have Latin American, for example, um, Spanish American, Brazilian, uh, these long essays full of names. And you think, gosh, Borges is there, Vallejo is there, um, Neruda, of course, is there, you know, tons and tons of writers. What will, of course, in Hindi transliteration, what would Hindi readers have made of it? And then uh, what I'm going to focus on today is Sarika, 
which is what I call war literature as a special issue, uh, which I think, as you will see, you know, has a, creates a quite a different effect from one story per, um, per issue. Uh, really creates a spectacular internationalism. Okay, so let me, so I want to focus on, on Sarika, uh, but as a comparator, let's look briefly at Kahani, which was one of the most respective story magazines. Um, as I said, it was heavily invested in translations. Um, and interestingly, you, you know, while, uh, with effect, you know, Bengali, sorry, from Bengali, uh, Urdu, one or two Punjabi, Marathi in every issue. Um, um, but while, in fact, the Kahani Kibat, the editorial by Sri Patrai, created a kind of sense of familiarity with, uh, you know, um, towards writers in other Indian languages, you know, reminding readers. Uh, that they had read other stories by the same writer or introducing them. That's not true of, of the foreign story. So, um, so I want to, you know, so think a little bit more about that. Now, um, the overall discourse of the magazine of Kahani was one of what I would call a soft progressivism. So it's about, you know, democratic, um, democratic, kind of mission of the magazine, also of the story, you know, the story, you know, the magazine, good stories at a good price. Huh? Um, um, learn, you know, kind of educating readers, not so much in, you know, in political terms, but really in uh, having, taking a habit, weaning them away from uh, uh, just entertaining reading, uh, weaning them away as Amritrai, uh, the brother, of course, of Shripat, um, um, sort of urge Kahani to do wing them away from the stories of Maya or Manoha Kahania to better, to better stories. Um, democratic also because, uh, for example, they started this Kahani club, so they urged readers to come together to discuss uh, the stories, to write in the magazine, to create also a sense of community between readers and writers. Now, Amrit's uh, Rai's um, letter in one of the first um, issues of Kahani, which really is a suggestion about what Kahani should do, is really what Kahani was doing. So, as you can see, you know, new talent, um, foreign, you know, other stories from other Indian languages, and then translations of the world masters, the ustad of the story. Um, now, what do you see uh, in foreign writers in Kahani? And this is a, a sample of four years. Actually, if you go beyond 1960, what you see is that, you know, the magazine started in 54, that this whole kind of um, translation effort, uh, translation activism dies down. And I think that's, you know, although it's very impressive for, uh, for these years, uh, particularly since, you know, it didn't have the, the Society Academy behind it, um, what I find is that, you know, these translation efforts are very difficult to sustain over a long time. Um, now, when it comes to world literature, Kahani, as you can see, the spatial and political orientation was definitely was the Eastern Bloc. Huh? So most of the stories are from China, then Russia, Soviet Russia, well, actually only three of them are really, well, Gorky, you could say, uh, sort of Soviet. Poor uh, communist time. Then the Ustad, uh, the Ustad of uh, you know, Western Europe, some and, and the US, some of them more leftist writers like Jack London. Um, interestingly, a story, you know, I think possibly the first translation or the first appearance of an African story by Kenyatta in, in, a, in Indian magazine and so on. Um, now, as I say, temporarily, only in fact, um, if some of the stories, however, so although political, you could say this is really, you know, uh, leftist internationalism of the 1950s, uh, actually, only few of the stories are contemporary and in fact sort of strongly kind of um, communist. So like New Age by 
this writer possibly called Kuyu. I'm not, I haven't found her or him, uh, which is about, you know, a, a couple who arrange, um, a reject the whole tradition of uh, dowry and gifts and big celebration, but go for a simple wedding. Um, more typically, you have stories like Morich, this one by Morich, which is what I call a kind of poverty and laughter. So a mother is so poor, she doesn't have the seven pennies to buy soap. And the whole story is about the kind of humorous, how she makes the search for a penny in the house, a humorous one until a beggar comes and gives her the last story. So what do we see is that temporarily, uh, they are very much uh, left internationalism, but it's as if politics pulls all the stories uh, by non-communist writers into the present and into the Eastern Bloc Cold War configuration. And of course, this orientation is also confirmed by the adverbs, uh, which are, you know, task publication, China, Naya Chin Visheshank, and the novels that um, Kahani um, translated and published. Yeah. yeah, and this is a interestingly rare uh, introduction to uh, Kenyatta's story, which is, as you can see, kind of clearly uh, political and anti-colonial. Now, let us now look at Sarika. As I say, the Hindi story magazine of the Times of India group, so definitely commercial, neither small nor elitist and nor avant-garde. So Kamleshwa became, uh, um, became when, uh, Kam, uh, and when Kamleshwa became editor, uh, after in fact having worked briefly at Kahani, then had been editor of this magazine that might be interesting to some of you, Ingit, uh, seems to be a, a, a foreign affairs um, magazine. I, I haven't been able to find it. And then assistant editor Nai Kahani of Raj Kamal, an editor briefly, and then Sarika before, for, for about a decade. Now, uh, and this is a, um, before him, Chandragupta Vidyalankar was the editor. And as you can see, before he became editor, the foreign stories tend to be um, more European, you could say, uh, mixed East and West European, uh, with clearly a kind of whiff of the cinematic in them. This is uh, um, Tobino, I think, Mario Tobino. But also interestingly, kind of um, both, Sarika both did literature, uh, were literature in different ways, but also with different orientations. So, as I say, the foreign stories were usually by contemporary European writers. Then it had a master's column, column Kahani Kya Hai uh, Masteron Kinigase. Um, and there, you know, of course, it's more um, canonical with older writers, Camus, Sartre, Checo, Flaubert, but, and more kind of. Um, um, Anglo-American. And then it had an interesting uh, column, which uh, uh, I'll go to in more in a minute, which is called Sahabhutiya, Aj ki kahani Sahabhutiya. And here the articles are much more oriented towards the decol colonizing world. So Indonesia, Egypt, and Iran. Of course, Iran, I mean, Iran part of the, of the kind of um, Asian uh, reorientation, you could say. Um, and so when Kahani, when Kamleshwa became editor, he took, um, he, he, in a sense, he, he took a slightly different approach. Uh, he went for um, the special issue. Um, so world literature really has a special issue. And you see how many he, uh, he uh, produced, some thematic, war stories, love, the courtesan, some political, the third world, neighboring country, Palestinian literature, and some love, love lighter, so lighter love courtesans and so on. Now, this is what I mean by uh, spectacular nationalism and war literature as a special issue. So already as editor as uh, Naika Hania, uh, we can see Kamleshwa really making visible um, Asian, Middle Eastern, Southeast Asian, Latin American and African literatures. Um, and, and I'm still amazed hmm, that in already in the 1960s and early 70s, 
ordinary readers were leading uh, Gugi Vationgo, Pramadyanan Tatur, Tayyab Saleh, and so on. And not just any story, uh, but actually some of their best stories. Uh, so the Martyr, uh, um, Garcia Marquez, uh, um, um, Siesta de Marte, uh, Tuesday Siesta, um, Pramodian Antator, um, um, Inem, uh, Alain Robrier, La Plage, uh, Guimaraes Rosa, The Third Shore. And I think what is really interesting, if you look at this, um, if you look at the world show story, and in fact, of course, we should also think about uh, these interesting covers. So the world show story uh, is very much, as you can see, you know, the multitude, hmm? the multitude of, um, of, uh, of peasants, of people, uh, certainly ordinary people uh, of uh, the third world. Uh, you still have some uh, European writers, uh, Boehl, uh, Robrier, uh, but basically they are kind of drowned uh, uh, but in this sea of writing from uh, Asia, Africa and Latin America. Uh, so, and in, interesting, I mean, I don't know, I don't, unfortunately, you know, there's not an archive or not an archive that I know, which, which says, you know, why certain covers were chosen, but, you know, uh, by contrast, the third world, Tisri Dunia, special issue, uh, and again, I think we're thinking of Sarika, so not really a political magazine, is almost like uh, offsetting the political contents uh, by, this, in this kind of um, funny, uh, funny cover. And again, here you have uh, a lot of um, writers from um, Asia, Africa, and Latin America. So I want to spend the rest of my, uh, my time uh, thinking about four clusters uh, in the possible ones of uh, Sarika's literary internationalism. The first one is, is Arabic and Egypt. And um, I'm, I'm interested because, in a way, um, you know, of course, Arabic was, was, you know, not new to India. There's a very long history of Arabic in India. There also had been uh, this whole uh, Muslim cosmopolitanism in the age of empire that historians have written about. But this is a new um, reaching out uh, to, um, uh, to the Middle East, to Arabic, to the Arab world, uh, which seems to be very much a kind of Bandung one. Um, and of course, so um, you've got Nasser coming to India, um, you've got Nehru going to Egypt, um, you've got the ICCR uh, Arabic uh, magazine, uh, so the ICCR launches uh, three magazines, one in English, one in French, and one is in Arabic, Tafaqat uh, Hind. Of course, I haven't looked at it, but I think it will be really fascinating to think, just to look at, you know, um, what is the, you know, what, what kind of uh, cultural um, remediation, I suppose, of memory or, or new uh, content is, um, is brought out. But also it's interesting in, of course, is what is left out, what is made visible and what is left out. And as you can see, there are quite a lot of, uh, of uh, stories by Arabic writers in uh, Sarika over the years, uh, including uh, Tayyip Saleh, uh, you know, one of the sort of great um, favored of postcolonial uh, studies, writers of postcolonial studies. Um, and and I want, but I want to focus mostly on uh, um, one of the earlier essays that Kamleshwar had written from, quoted from Ingit in uh, Sarika on uh, the Egyptian short story, uh, because it gives us a sense of what you know, how Kamleshwar does uh, internationalism. So um, Kamleshwar begins with ancient Egyptian tales and then jumps over centuries of darkness straight to Napoleon's invasion. As you can see, he, uh, you know, since you get no written or oral evidence, so whatever evidence you get is very scant, which uh, seems uh, very questionable. Um, but I suppose, as I, I would say, has, has a, some kind of effect. Um, then, um, then there's this kind of implicit con, uh, comparison with British colonialism in India, of course, and so he criticizes uh, 
Napoleon's attack, but also sees it as an engine of uh, modernization. Um, and also kind of a very similar sense of modernity as a Western import. Um, and he plots it in the familiar terms of struggle between Western modernity and indigenous tradition uh, until you know you get to a to a synthesis. So you, here you have the the Nahda, uh, and then you get to some kind of synthesis, um, a new generation, um, a kind of modernism uh, uh, in, uh, in in Arabic literature, um, and uh, a kind of uh, Arabic naikahani. So if in uh, the 1920s and 50s in, in Hindi, Kamleshwar and other writers had argued that the new conditions of post-independent India, uh, the naiparistitia, required more than plain, the plain social realism of Princhan or Yashpal, an attunement to the nuances of the um, uh, sort of anubhuti, uh, the in, inner experience of individuals. Uh, so they claim that their stories were realistically come without being mechanical or propagandist, which was an accusation directed at progressive social realism, and, and with an emphasis on style, uh, without, however, descending into obscurity. And I think we can see very much uh, the, same, um, the same critical language used for the Egyptian short story and Arabic fiction more generally. Huh? So um, uh, Yusuf al-Sabai co is called the founder of the idea of Vyaktitwa, individuality for the uh, characters of the Arabic new, short, new story. Wahabi, uh, there too, uh, emphasis was laid on the Anubhuti Parak Pramanikta, Par Wahabi Zor Diagya. Just like the new Hindi Naikahani, the story there, first of all, began, began its search in the field of language. Um, and finally, uh, although um, this is a story about Mahmoud Taimur, uh, so actually of an earlier generation, Shaurat Kimor Zindabad, part of an odd story about a man who decides to uh, murder a cabaret dancer in order to get, you know, his one day of shohrat in the newspapers. But what, what I want to point out here is the kind of familiarity uh, that is projected. Hindi readers, especially Sarikas, are very familiar with his works. Uh, he's considered the Arabic Princhen. Yeah, this is one of his best short stories. Uh. Um, so you can see, uh, so it's, there's a kind of, political orientation, a narrative, a kind of parallel uh, of familiarity. Mm -hmm. so, um, now, when we come to Indonesia again, there, as I, I could find only two stories uh, published um, by Sarika. One, one, in fact, a very fine story by, by Pramodian Antator from the Tales of Blora, Inem, um, we are given rather sort of, uh, you know, one of those favored, uh, you know, ink, uh, very, very sort of dark uh, illustrations favored by Hindi uh, magazines. Um, seems to have been reduced because actually it's a longer story, but here is only uh, sort of four columns. And another is Mortar Lubis's uh, uh, Saigon House, but a, but a peasant trying to build his house. Um, but interestingly, again, Kamleshwa has a very informed, uh, very informed, very detailed uh, essay uh, with names, again, creating familiarity and parallels. So, uh, you know, the modern literature became, began around the early 20th century, that is the Bhartendu Yug. Uh, it's similar to in India because there's also there a struggle for a Jatiya Bhasha. Um, then this whole, the, uh, again, the kind of Naikahani discourse of then giving names of prominent writers, poets, um, already recognizing Pramodian Antator, which I think, I mean, I certainly only discovered through Benedict Anderson's uh, Imagine Community, but, you know, uh, communities, but here he is already mentioned as the most forceful writer in Hindi in the 1960s. 
um, mentions critics and so on. Now, the, the, this was 1966 when the article was uh, written and published. Uh, this was just after the, you know, the purge of communists in, uh, in uh, 1965. I know the sort of the killings of the killing fields. I don't know if this is a kind of reference to, but you can see, you can see that uh, to, to that or to the kind of political instability within Indonesia. Uh, you can see these are, you know, um, the orientation you could say is political, but actually um, the, there is not that much direct reference to politics, which is, is interesting and I'll come back to it in a moment. Um, now, if we come to the general issues of sources, again, temporality and political orientation, what do we see? Well, the sources typically are not indicated. Um, so we have to just guess. Um, I think, um, I mean, I see this really as a, you know, I call this literary activism because I see it as a activism, both in sourcing as well as in curating what was probably, you know, the, what was the large amount of printed material that in fact those propaganda, various propaganda and internationalist networks um, created. So uh, one could have been, you know, a source probably was Lotus, to which I'll come in a moment. Another one could have been, you know, this middle brow, you could say American New York uh, short story magazine called Short Story International, which itself uh, republished, a bit like a Reader's Digest, so republished um, translations of, of stories. So here, for example, you have a translation of uh, Borges's Emma Zunz, and also Bureau Trading by um, the German-Mexican writer B. Traven, which were both published in uh, Naikahania um, under Kamleshwa. So possibly he might may have got them from them, from there. Um, now, in terms of temporality, again, I think it's a similar um, a similar process to what we saw with Kahani. So there's a, a political temporality of the noun now and a literary temporality which is much older. So, um, you know, one of the arguments about literature magazines and the Cold War and Cold War internationalism is, has been that for the first time you had a, a global contemporaneity of, of literature. So the same story, particularly if you think of the ICCF um, network of, of magazines, uh, of journals, the same story could be published, you know, at the same time in, in the different um, um, different journals. But actually what I think then you, you then you actually go and see and the temporality is not the temporality of the now. It's very mixed. Some, some is, you know, some, some stories are pretty recent uh, and some are much, much earlier. Mm. And politically too, I mean, if you look at the Latin American stories, for example, um, in Naikahania and Sarika, you know, they are across the border, nor are they all political by any stretch of the imagination. And in fact, you could say, okay, you've got writers like Garcia Marquez, for example, who are, you know, of course, very much, uh, you know, very aligned with Cuba and so on, but you've got a Cuban American writer like Calvert Casey, who, whose relationship with the Cuban revolution and whose story itself, execution, is much more um, uh, ambiguous and ambivalent and uh, yeah, and not at all kind of, um, you know, not at all uh, straightly aligned. Some of the stories are, you know, office, office romance, um, office life and getting a pay rise, uh, um, you know, all kinds of all kinds of you know everyday stories. Now, what is really interesting, and that's my third or my fourth points, is how Kamleshwar uh, sort of frames uh, the stories and frames his understanding of the third world. Um, so, as I say, I mean clearly he frames the context as the third world uh, and focuses on. The, um, on the sort of common experience of uh, colonialism and underdevelopment. Mm -hmm. 
So interestingly, really takes third world as a as a badge. Hmm? Um, and and this is a and 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 this idea that you know these are you know the the the, the voices from the third from the literatures of the third world now have to be heard. Huh? They've come on the world stage, hmm? and this is a very similar stance to that of Lotus, the um, uh, the magazine uh, of the Bureau of Afro-Asian uh, Writers that was based first in Colombo and then in, in Cairo, that instead was very much aligned, you know, was funded partly by um, the Egyptian state and partly by an Egypt, uh, East, East German foundation. Uh, but, you know, you see, it makes a similar kind of argument. Uh, some of the, um, yeah, so uh, as you can see, Plichli, and so on. And in fact, several of the African writers in Sarika, uh, I mean, I haven't quite checked all the pieces, but clearly come from, from, um, from Lotus. And Lotus, very excitingly, was published in English, French, and Arabic. Um, Yes, and in fact, for example, Sarika, again, sort of seems to, to embrace some of that spirit. Uh, this is a uh, African literature issues uh, for an anniversary of the Organization of African Unity meeting in Mauritius. And, and interesting, Mauritius seems to have been a kind of linchpin between, um, between India and Africa. There's a lot of stories of Aminanyo Anat um, published in, uh, in uh, Sarika. And this particular meeting was held in Mauritius. But again, you know, amazing uh, range of, of writers. Uh, so similar to Lotus, but you wouldn't find. Uh, in Lotus, you also have, you know, special issue on the centenary of Lenin. Um, you know, Lotus is clearly aligned, which of course, uh, Sarika is not. And in fact, so, um, so interestingly, Kamleshwa starts from starts off from political decolonization and the development, the global south, huh? the whole southern far, half of the globe. Hmm? Um, and starts from there. Uh, but then he says, uh, his, his editorial uh, uh, is called Dono Tatonse Ubkar. Hmm? So in a way it's not. Uh, so, and, and you can see a Cold War uh, hint there, uh, the Mahashaktiya. Uh, so, um, so although this is not the third world issue, this is a, 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 another um, international story issue, but, you know, so tired of, the, of both shores, uh, tired of the two fronts, um, he says these are superficial and two-dimensional matters. There's a third dimension, so third suddenly doesn't be, is no longer third world, uh, but it's something else, it's the third dimension. Uh, it's the third dimension of, of literature, really. Extremely delicate and abstract. And Dono Tatonse Upkar is in fact the, um, a, a, a direct reference to um, the Brazilian writer, Jao Guimarães Rosa, third bank of the river, uh, Nadika Tisra Kinara, uh, really beautifully translated by Dham Virbharti for once. Uh, not all the translations are so good which is about a father who leaves his family, uh, leaves his family and goes to live on a boat in the middle of the river and never comes off. A sort of very, and, and it's a very sort of philosophical story about, you know, uh, time, about the, the aim of life and so on. And this is in fact how it is presented uh, in, the, in the magazine. And this is also how the readers perceive it. So, no direct political alignment and certainly no social realist aesthetic. My final, uh, final example, again, is, a, is an interesting one. So in 1973, um, Kamleshwa publishes a um, with stories from um, Pakistan, Nepal, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and Afghanistan, and beefed up by Thailand and uh, Mauritius. Uh, and I think, and I wonder here whether we can uh, talk about a kind of proactive use of the special issue. I mean, is this a, in a, in a way, as a sort of 
uh, attempt to say, okay, let's have uh, this neighboring country, you know, diplomacy, a kind of uh, people to people, mm, literature to literature uh, mm, relations uh, that, um, that, you know, our countries don't manage to have. Uh, the editorial is a bit um, kind of, um, mm, and, you know, leaves it a bit vague, I would say. It's more about, uh, and in fact, it's, it's in a way, it's not so political as such. Uh, it's, well, again, the politics, the common politics is the politics of the past, the centuries of slavery, poverty, hunger, oppressive rulers. Um, and it's all about the kind of the similarities of people's lives uh, and people's struggles, ordinary people's daily struggles in, um, you know, across these countries. Um, and, um, and the question here, the aim is, are writers in this country also uh, sort of doing what we are doing with Sarika, which, you know, presented itself as a magazine for, you know, a, a sort of a, Sah party, you know, a sort of a, a sort of a, not Sah party, but a sort of a fellow traveler, hmm? uh, sort of on the on of, of readers in their daily struggle struggles, hmm? and and in a way the answer was yes. Huh? Um, said despite the different systems of rule, the the ajib but dilchasp uh, kaleidoscope of uh, systems of rule, the paradox is that. Uh, whatever the system, the Rashtrani Mata do everything in the name of the people, of the Janta, but it's the Janta who suffers and one should read. Now, again, um, and I'm, you know, I'm st still um, wondering about this and, I'm, and I wonder what you think, because again, the, the, you know, you could say that the overall framing is quite political. Hmm? So, our neighbors, uh, we should know our neighbors and their literatures better. Uh, we should uh, develop, in fact, we should know them as well. And uh, we should develop this sort of fellow feeling. Um, and, but again, the stories are not, uh, are not political at all. They're very kind of ordinary life stories. So I know about a sort of a, 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 a chara, charsi, charas addicted um, uh, men, um, in, in the Afghan uh, story uh, by Baba Abdurashid, who has lost his uh, fiance hmm, and, uh, and, and an encounter between them. Um, typically a kind of a, a life in the day. Uh, so here a, a sort of lower middle class art student who goes to meet uh, some, some political activist not specified in hospital and then struggles to find the money to bring him some oranges the next day and here a man who was attracted by um, his friend's wife and sort of receives a real tamacha and then a symbolic tamacha from her uh, another time. So, um, so to, to come to my conclusion, so um, how do magazines do world literature and and how do they make it visible? Well, I, I've shown that actually they do it in quite different ways. Uh, they, they, they have different strategies. Um, I think to me, the, the kind of spectacular, uh, you know, the, the special issue is a particularly effective one because it really, A, gives the sense of the, you know, a re very tangible sense of the, of the um, you know, the variety, the, you know, the world literature out there. But also helps us, you know, think about um, how is the world imagined uh, in in this particular time. I think, you know, if I was thinking, I think if you had a, a world literature special issue in an Italian or British magazine at the time, you would probably have had, you know, many more European or you know Western writers or even Eastern European, and then maybe a couple of you know African Asian writers or Latin American tagged on. Uh? You wouldn't have had this very very clear reorientation hmm, towards um, Latin America, Asia, and Africa. Um, does political, um, does political um, orientation guide literary visibility? I think the, the answer is definitely yes. Huh? But, uh, but the answer of the second one, of the third question, does political orientation imply a particular aesthetic? I think uh, so. 
um, is is a more um, in, requires more. You know, it's not it's not such a straightforward one. I think I think you know the Cold War. Uh, you know, speaking of Cold War literature or the Cold War uh, framework, make us think uh, of uh, political alignments as also aesthetic ones. Uh? But I think what we see both already with, with Kahani and certainly much more with Sarika is that a, a sort of a political orientation um, comes with, in fact, or with a sort of very, very um, possibly, you know, the quite, quite, quite different uh, aesthetic uh, orientation or of, uh, of the editor, uh, of the literary activist. So that, in fact, already in Lotus, but certainly in Sarika, you know, to think of, of these magazines as all um, oriented towards, um, you know, socialist, realist aesthetic, because their, 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 their worldly orientation is towards um, Asia and Africa or the tricontinental, I think would be very wrong. Okay, I think I will uh, stop here and I will stop sharing and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Francesca, for uh, giving us a lucid picture of uh, the uh, uh, Cold War period and especially the Hindi scene and especially the fictional scene in Hindi and uh, there too, uh, Sarika's take on uh, fictional take, but uh, the international orientation.